When we dive into Philippians, if you got your Bible, you can turn to Philippians chapter 3. It's where we're going to be jumping around this morning. When, when I talk about Paul and I talk about uh, the letter, you know, one of the things that I've done over the past couple of months is I've really dug into Paul's life in Philippians. And the more I dig into him, the more I am just astounded and the more respect I have for this guy. And I know that sounds weird. He's the Apostle Paul pretty much, you know, planted the modern day church, wrote a lot of the New Testament. But I think when when I talk about the the level of, because we're in a series, week three, it's called More Than Happy. When I talk about the the level of astonishment over the fact that Paul could find joy where he's at, I don't think I can do it justice. I, I don't feel like I give a good enough picture. And then when I look at something like that, and yes, it was not supposed to have sound. It was supposed to be very kind of in your face because the reality of it is, is this is a situation Paul was in. Paul was writing a letter to the church of Philippi and it was around 62 to 64 AD under great distress. He, he wasn't, you know, uh, just writing it from his hotel room. He was writing it to a chained guard. And I think oftentimes when, when we talk about this, we, we don't compute because we do live in the greatest nation in, on the planet and we have freedoms beyond measure and and we're allowed to come in and worship you know we can raise our hands we can put them in our pockets we can pray we can talk we can we can share God with with whoever we want but but in this time in Paul's life the Roman Empire was persecuting Christians at an unprecedented level and so we're going to jump right in Philippians chapter 3 if you got your Bible turn there if you don't we're going to put it on the screen for you Uh, it says Whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. Now, just that sentence right there, I think that the gravity of that statement, Paul's Paul's challenge to us, and that sentence right there is huge. He says, whatever happens, and when I see our, our friend there, I go, man, she found peace. In one of the most brutal situations, not just in her life, but in her family's life, in slavery, in captivity, in abuse, in torture. She found peace and she found forgiveness. Paul has tapped into something in Philippians that I think is is way beyond happiness. He says, in whatever, rejoice in the Lord. And then he goes on to say, I never get tired of telling you these things, and I do it to safeguard your faith, safeguard your faith. This morning, we're going to look at how to safeguard our joy. You know, th- this letter in the context of just a preacher, if I was writing this letter to somebody, I don't think the context of it would would mean as much because Paul wasn't writing from a church. He wasn't writing from a hotel. He wasn't writing, you know, from a church office with AC blowing. He was chained to a Roman guard sitting on death row, 24 hours surveillance. And he was chained to this guard, not because of a crime that he committed, but for simply accepting Christ and telling others about Christ. He was not a criminal. He did not, by all metrics of society, deserve what he was doing. He was in a jail cell, and those jail cells weren't three hots and a cot. It was a brutal. The Roman Empire hated. They despised Christians. Paul is telling us in the, in, in the middle of this, it's like our friend, in the middle of some of the worst circumstances possible in Paul's life. Like he didn't know. He was on death row. He knew his life was coming to an end. In some of the worst situations, Paul is saying this. He said, whatever, whatever situation you're in, rejoice in the Lord. Whatever situation you're in, have joy in the Lord. You see, happiness is based on happenings. That's why we we constantly fluctuate between, oh, I'm happy, oh, I'm not. Ooh, this makes me happy until it doesn't. My new truck makes me really happy until the transmission falls out, right? I got this new house until somebody gets a bigger one. I've got this new job until I can't stand my boss. Happiness is based on circumstances. Happiness is based on the situation that we're in. But Paul is tapping into something that goes far beyond happiness. He's tapping into a joy which can only be found with a relationship with Jesus Christ. And as we get further into Philippians, this is shown more and more and more. And that's why I say when I I dug into Philippians this week, even deeper, I'm like, I am astounded at what Paul was able 
to tap into because I wonder how many American Christians would find joy in, in, in what this young lady was going through. I wonder how many American Christians would find joy in, in being incarcerated for no crime whatsoever, but just because you claim to follow Jesus. As a matter of fact, our society has actually told us that we're not even allowed to talk about Jesus in our workplace. We're not allowed to talk about Jesus on our campuses. We're not allowed to talk about Jesus in, in the realm of, of government or in politics. You see, Paul, though, he wasn't worried about losing his job. I mean, most of us clam up or most of us get, get hesitant to, to share Jesus because we might get made fun of. Most of us get, get hesitant because, oh, they may think I'm one of those crazy people or, or what about oh, I may lose my job. But see, Paul wasn't worried about losing a job. Paul knew because of his faith and because of his teaching of Jesus Christ, because of his, his witness to others, that he was going to die. And Paul is saying this in this verse. He's saying, I don't mind telling you over and over because you need to hear it. You need the joy that can only be found in Christ to safeguard your life, to safeguard your mental status. You see, we live in a culture that anxiety and depression is so prevalent and worry is so present. You see, rejoicing in Christ is a safeguard of your mind. Rejoice in Christ in all things. So this morning I want to look at four things, and they all begin with the letter P. And that is because that's how my brain works. But there's four things that Paul teaches us through Philippians that allows us to safeguard our joy regardless of the circumstances. It allows us to safeguard our heart, safeguard our mind. And this is what I know. We're entering into a season. We're entering into Thanksgiving, we're entering into Christmas, where there's going to be some feelings that, that bubble to the surface, there's going to be some hurts, there's going to be some grief, maybe you've lost somebody over the holidays, maybe you've had some bad memories of the holidays, there's a lot of emotion tied in around the holidays, and so this is a, a way that we could safeguard our joy not just during the holidays, but moving forward, but especially over the next couple of months, Philippians 2 I'm sorry, Philippians 3, 2 through 4 talks about you need the right perspective. That's the first key that, that Paul teaches us to safeguard our joy is you have to have the right perspective. Think about it for a second. Chained up, probably beaten, not really given much food, chained to a soldier. That means no privacy whatsoever. That, that means every bit of, of self-worth uh, that you would have laid at the foot of the cross. And Paul goes on to say this. He says, watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil, those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. I'm going to come back to that for a second. We put no confidence in human effort, though I could have confidence in my own effort if anyone could. Indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. See, Paul is saying right here what, what a lot of people don't realize about Paul, and we'll talk about this a little later in the, in the message, is Paul was a very educated kind of a religious elite person at the beginning of his life. Up until he actually had an encounter with God on the road to Damascus, Paul was well-versed. Paul was well-trained. Paul could tell you all of the laws of Moses. Paul was kind of at the top of the chain when it came to the religious elite. And what Paul is saying here is like, he's not being cocky, but he's saying, hey, if there's anybody that can boast, I'm the one that can boast. I've got the street cred. I've got the religious credibility. I've got the law of Moses down to a T. He said, if anybody could boast, but what he's actually talking about is he's talking about this group of people, they were called Judaizers, who, who were saying that the law of the Old Testament, they were saying that the only way you could be right with God was through circumcision, which was an Old Testament part of the covenant between the, the Israelites and God, and, and they were saying it's, it's the, the Old Covenant that the only way you could truly be right with God is by what you do, by following the old law. They, they weren't 
weren't taking into account that Jesus had come and established a new covenant, that Jesus had come and by, by him dying on the cross and raising from the dead, that the curtain ripped and, and the old covenant was no more. There was a new covenant. There was a new system. And that system and that covenant was Jesus Christ and through faith in Christ alone. They, they, these, these guys, they weren't putting their faith in Jesus, they were still leaning back into the old ways, into the old covenant, into the old systems. And I believe this is a, a, a fear of mine that, that we often have here is, is we try constantly to understand an infinite God. And there's only a certain point. I don't care how educated you are. I don't care how much college you've had. I don't care how many books you've read. There's only a certain point that you can reach a level of understanding with God before it becomes a faith thing. And I think oftentimes that we use systems. We use, And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with systems or anything wrong with traditions. But when traditions supersede the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, it becomes a problem. And that's what Paul was kind of admonishing here, is he was saying, look, it's not about the old covenant. It's not about the old system. It is solely based on a faith in Jesus Christ. I think oftentimes, even today, we fall back on our own understanding. We fall back on our own custom. It's, it's, I, I, can, I can rationalize. I, I can, especially in the, in the Christmas season, Season or the holiday season is is we often revert back to things that that give us comfort because we can understand them. We wrap our brains around them. Like when I hear these songs that were played today, I can't grasp the amount of love that God had for us. I can't grasp the amount of relationship that He wants with us for somebody to sacrifice their own son. For somebody to sacrifice their own child, I mean, it just doesn't compute in my head, especially for a guy as broken as I am. It doesn't compute, but, but Paul is saying this, look, systems will only get you so far. We have to believe in the faith of Jesus Christ. It's, you, trying to revert back to understanding is actually what got Adam and Eve from the beginning of time, the tree of knowledge. They, they wanted to be like God. Lucifer, when he was cast out of heaven, wanted to be like God. They, they, they needed an understanding of God. I've, I've told people there, there comes a point, like when I get into theological debates, and they often hit a point where I look at them and I go, look, man, I don't understand. I don't understand some of the things that happen in the world, and, and that's a good thing to me because if I can understand God, he ceases to be God. I need somebody who I trust has control over situations that I can't begin to fathom. You see, Christ isn't a system. Jesus isn't a system of, of things that you can do or you can't do. Jesus Christ came, and he simply said this, have faith in me. Have faith in me. And for some people, that blows your mind because it's too easy. Like we've, we've lived in a culture where it says if it's too good to be true, it is. Well, to, to sit here and say, well, if I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that, that Jesus was raised from the dead, I will be saved. Like I don't have to get right. If I had a dollar for everybody that I invite to church and they're like, man, I'm going to be there as soon as I get some things right. And I'm like, if that's what you're waiting on, I'll never see you. Because I don't have everything right. Nobody sitting in this room has everything right. And Paul is saying this, that, that we can't lean on our own understanding. We can't lean on our, our own comfort. The Bible even talks about it. It says, lean not on your own understanding. In all ways, acknowledge Christ. In all things, point to Christ. In, in all decisions, point to Christ. And he will direct your path. And here's the problem with systems. Systems and people will let you down. Guaranteed. I guarantee you that systems and people will let you down. Ah, I had a 30-year retirement plan. It was in a very safe mutual fund. That financial guy, he was the top of the game. He told me that it was 8 to 10% that I would be able to retire at the age of 55 if I just stuck to the plan, right? And then 2008 hit. I got no more plan. I got no more retirement. Or how about the guy who was out in, in California? He went through the recession, so he had a better plan. 
He put all of his money, all of his life savings, all of, he invested in artwork. And he put all of these into this amazing fireproof safe. I just read about him the other day. Put it all into the top of the line fireproof safe. He had a system. The bank wasn't ever going to jack with him again, right? Until the wildfire came through. And you know what he has now? He said, I had $20 in my pocket and the clothes on my back. Everything else I have is dust. Systems will let us down. The world will let us down. People will let us down. You know what? I, I have 100% trust in them. I know that they would never stab me in the back until that big promotion comes and what you realize is he's gone to the boss with your idea. People will let you down. You know what? I looked up. that There was this Christian in my life, and I looked up to them, and they were a godly person, and they were a mentor, and, and they were bringing me along, and, and then all of a sudden they got mad, and, and I heard them just tear people down and eviscerate them, and then the church split. And you know what? I figured out that, that Christians, just they're just a bunch of hypocrites. And so I never walked back into a church again. Or how about this? Man, there was this pastor. Like, he gave us marriage counseling. <laughs> he spoke into my marriage. He, he led me to Christ. He baptized me. He spoke into my family. He was at Christmas dinner with us. And then one Sunday, I sat in there, and, and I listened to him talk about how everything was fake because he had a moral failure. You see, Paul is saying, don't rely on systems. Don't rely on people. There is only one system. There is only one person that regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the situation, regardless of what that person does or says, that you can still find joy. But one of the ways you have to safeguard that joy is perspective. I don't know why God has me in this situation. I don't know why I lost my job, but I'm going to believe that he is going to supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. I don't know why my relationship is on the rocks, but I'm going to trust that he is working in me and through me and in them and through them and that our marriage is going to come out on the back side of this storm even stronger and, and wiser than it ever was. And that my children, that even though it's a chaotic mess right now, that they're going to see Christ work through our dysfunction right now. And that they're going to grow up knowing that as long as you put Christ at the center, he can restore all things. I don't know why I'm sitting in this jail cell. You know, God, I, I did everything you told me to do. I'm out there preaching about you. I'm working for you. But I, I'm chained to this Roman soldier, and I'm going to die. And I don't know why, but this is what I trust, that even through my death, that your name will be glorified. Think about the level of joy that has to, to think, think about the, the level of commitment to Christ. Paul has tapped into something. That goes far beyond happiness. That goes far beyond circumstances. Because he is in a circumstance where he's going to die. I have a simple question and a simple truth. The question is, in perspective, are you living for the world or are you living for Christ? Is your faith in the world? Is your faith in the system? Is your faith in, in some guy in Washington, D.C.? Is your faith in, in a system or your job or your career or the banks or, or your paycheck? Is your faith in the world? Or is your faith in Jesus Christ where you said, you know what? Even if I wake up tomorrow and I have nothing, I still have him. Even if I wake up tomorrow and everything I've worked so hard for is gone. I still have the kingdom of God. Wow, when you think about that, when you think about the level of joy that brings, and you see our world is so image-driven. Our world is so so world-driven. Is, is what do they think about me? What do they, 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 they look like? What, what do I look like? I mean, we have whole systems set up. We, we have multi-billion dollar industries so we can feed our own egos with Snapchat and Instagram and Facebook, and, and we want to look good, and we want to have so many friends, and, and, and our, our anxiety and our depression and our self-worth is based on how many friends that you don't really have, but they click that you're friends. Or your self-worth is whether somebody says, oh, I love your picture that you spent two hours trying to, like, get the right, you know, selfie stick and angle and, 
If you're Christian, you put a Bible and a latte in front of it. You know it's true. You know it's true. How many of them pictures do you actually take first thing in the morning when you're in your house coat and your kids are acting a fool? And you're getting out of the car and you, you're driving up to church and you're skidding in and you, little Johnny got one shoe on. Y'all don't take those pictures, do you? I know because I saw some of y'all do that this morning. It's kind of funny. Stand out in the parking lot with me one Sunday. It's amusing. Y'all crack me up. But it's true. We spend our, our, the majority of our time trying to allow our self-worth to be filtered through people, through systems. Oh, I need my boss to give me a promotion. I need my boss to give me a raise. I, I need my teacher to give me a pat on the head. When, when Paul is saying this, he said, true joy, rejoice, regardless of what they say, regardless of what they do, regardless of what the system does. It's a game-changing perspective. Paul says, I pray that he will. I know that Paul prayed that God would, God would uh, free him from this prison. I mean, he'd done it before. Like, he opened up doors. They walked out. Thing that cracked me up is they walked out, walked right back into where they weren't supposed to be and continued preaching. God could have done it. But Paul said this. He said, I pray that he will. But even if he doesn't, I will trust and rejoice in him. That's a game-changing perspective. I pray that, that he gives me the promotion. But even if he doesn't. I'm going to continue to trust and praise him. I pray that he heals me. But even if he doesn't, I'm going to rejoice and joy that he'll be glorified through the process. I, I, I pray that, that that relationship can be restored. But even if it doesn't, I pray that he can somehow be glorified in all things. The second thing Paul teaches us to safeguard our joy is this. You have to know the right path. You have to know the right path. Philippians 3, 12 through 14, and for some of you OCD people, I'm jumping all over the place, so don't get on to me. He says this, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Jesus Christ, is calling us. Again, Paul is saying, hey, look, if there's somebody that can boast about the accomplishments, it's me. If there's somebody that can boast about religious pedigree, it's me. But I don't look at that. I just pray that, God, that, that I'm running my race, and I pray that, that there is a path that I'm on, and I pray that I can continue to glorify God through that. And, and here's the simple truth, that in today's modern church, I, I often ask this question, do you think Jesus would be welcome in our churches today? But the truth of it is, Paul in our modern church, I'm not even sure he could join a church. Because you see, in Paul's past, he killed a bunch of people, or he had a bunch of people killed. He stood and watched as, as people were stoned because of their faith in Jesus, not because they were criminals. But he, he was really good at what he did. And what he did is he tracked down and he killed Christians. And so Paul is saying this, look, man, I've got a past. I've got a past. But I don't look at my past. I look forward to the glory of God because God has restored me. God has forgiven me. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. You can't speak against my past because I press on. And here's what I know. When you step out in God's calling and God's favor and God's purpose in your life, you absolutely will have people come against you. You'll have people come up and, and tell you that you're not qualified. You see, God called Paul for a very specific purpose. God made it a point on a road to Damascus to show himself. Paul had an encounter with God that not many of us had. Audibly made him blind and reached to him and he knew it when he met him he said lord lord and see god god healed him from his blindness and he said now i have a plan and a purpose and paul said i will follow you to the end of my life and paul is nearing the end of his life but he recounts the past and he said i'm not going to let the past hinder me from my future i'm not going to let the past hinder me from the calling that god has on my life he said i press forward in the calling that god has 
You see, people are going to tell you that you aren't qualified. People are going to tell you that you're not educated. Now, people are going to tell you that, that, that whatever you're stepping out in is too big for you. Maybe you need to go get some school. Maybe you need to have some training. Maybe you need to, Let me tell you something. When God calls you to a plan and a purpose, step out in confidence. Because he's going to be the one that supplies all your needs. Not education. Not, and I'm not dogging education. I'm not dogging books. But God said, Paul, he said, I want you to move forward. I want you to reach a lost world. You see, I see a lot of Paul in Jesus. I see a lot of Jesus in Paul. I, I hear a lot of the same verbiage in, in this. Jesus said, I came to seek and save those who are lost. Paul was constantly buttoned up against the religious elite. And he said, hey, be all things unto all people so that they may come to know Christ. Be all things unto all people. Don't worry about all the, the white noise. Don't worry about all the systems. Don't worry about all the junk. Here's the deal. You know what the most important thing is? Grow the kingdom. Grow the kingdom. Bring people to Christ. Because here's the truth of it. Systems, people, buildings, chairs, pews, all of it's going to one day go away. The, 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 the thing that breaks my heart is I drive down the road and I see these awesome cathedrals. You see pictures of it in Europe. I mean, cathedrals that can see thousands that have turned into bird's nests, that have turned into rotting, decaying buildings. And the truth of it is, it's not about the buildings. It's not about, it's not about the systems. It's not about the, the songs or the bumper videos or the guitars. It's about Jesus Christ. And Paul is saying this. He's saying, make it about Jesus. Don't worry about what people come against you with. Don't worry. You follow what God put in front of you as your path. And the number one priority of your path should simply be this. Bring others to Christ. All the rest of it, some of it's needed, some of it's not. But it all points to Jesus. And here's what Paul is saying. Will it reach people for Christ? Will it grow the kingdom? And if the answer is yes, roll with it. Because ultimately that's what matters the most. Paul says it this way. He says, what Jesus did in the past is far more important than what you did in the past. And here's what I know in a, in a melting pot church of, of crazy, broken, jacked up people is we have a lot of stories in this room. We have a lot of past in this room, and I'm one of them. But this is what I know. What Jesus Christ did in the past is far more important than what I did. Because his past covers my past and my future, and it covers yours. So don't let your past hold you back from the calling that God has. To safeguard your joy, you got to know the path that God gave you, and you got to stick with it. Don't let people deter you from the mission that God called you to have. You also need the right passion to safeguard. You have to have the right passion. And it says it like this, Philippians 3, 7 through 9. I once thought that these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it as garbage. Think about that statement for a second. For his sake. And see, this is where it gets radical. This is where Paul is probably at a different level. Is Paul is saying everything else in life is garbage except Christ. Everything else, I've lived on the high end, I've lived on the low end, but everything else I see is garbage compared with gaining Christ and becoming one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteousness through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on our what? Faith. It doesn't depend on our church attendance. We want you to attend church. It's a good thing. It doesn't uh, depend on how much money you put in an offering plate. We want you to put money in an offering plate. It doesn't depend on what kind of bumper stickers you have on your car. It doesn't depend on what kind of, of, of icon you have on your chain. Paul says this. He said, righteousness comes through a faith in Jesus Christ and only through Jesus Christ. Rush, come up here and make me sound really good. Or Brian or whoever's playing a guitar. 
We're going to get ready to close out this morning. And I want to talk to you a little bit about passion. You see the, the, the passion that we have to have, the passion we saw with our young lady at the beginning, the passion that we see through Paul. You see economies and politics and leaders, cars, homes, boats, education, all of it's going to go away. There's a verse, it was one of the very first verses I ever learned. It was in what we called Bible drills. You may have heard them called sword drills. I grew up Baptist and there was this thing that we did. And it was Isaiah 47. And it said, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. And see, here's what I know. Everything that we have at some point is going to go away. And we're going to stand before God the Father. And he's not going to ask us what size home we had. He's not going to ask us what kind of truck we drove. He's not going to ask us how many fish we caught. What he is going to ask us is, who did you point to me? And here's what Paul tapped into. Your level of passion for Christ will determine your level of joy. Because if you filter it through this, if you filter joy through, I'm going to rejoice in the Lord regardless of my circumstances, that this house may burn my truck may break down. My friendships may fall apart. But I've got my eye on something bigger. I've got my eye on the prize. I've got my eye on the race. Is that I serve a God who I don't understand why all the time. But I know this, that I'm his child. And that, that even in the worst circumstances, I'll put my trust in here. Let me ask you a question this morning. What would you be willing to sacrifice for him? Would you sacrifice your job? Would you sacrifice a friendship? Would you sacrifice your home? What would you sacrifice for him? Paul says, I want to know his power. He says, I want to know his power. When you truly know Christ, you truly have his power in you. He, you. You have his power to change your life. You have his power to overcome temptation. You have his power to overcome strongholds that you may have been bound by for years. You have his power to overcome fear. You have his power to, to, to overcome the fear of death or the fear of loss. You have his power to overcome anxiety. You have his power to overcome depression. You have his power to overcome worry. You have power to break through bitterness. As we move into the Christmas season, I'm going to challenge each and every one of you. If there's somebody in your life you need to forgive, you need to forgive them. We're getting ready to enter into communion here in a little bit. It calls on us to enter into communion with a clean heart. And by that, it means you should not have an offense against another person. But you only find that power through the power of Jesus Christ. You only find that power through Him, through the joy that you find in Him. It goes on to say this in verse 10. I want to know Christ and I want to experience the mighty power that raised Him from the dead. I want to suffer with Him, sharing in His death, so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection from the dead. Paul, Paul says this, he says, to be absent from the body is to be with God. Think about that. I'm on death row. I'm chained. Think about your worst circumstance that you could be in. Paul is saying, I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to rejoice when I'm strapped to a table. I'm going to rejoice when I get some bad news. I'm going to rejoice when, when my relationship's a little rocky. I'm going to rejoice in the fact that I have a bother, uh, father who has my best interest at heart. There's this story came from a book, A Voice of the Martyrs. There's this little 10-year-old girl, and, uh, and she lived over in the Philippines. And, and this little 10-year-old girl, there, there was a church there that was founded by some missionaries, and and this 10-year-old girl would, would go up to the church almost every day. And especially on Sunday, she, she would get up there and, and, and she would go because she, she was seeing this happiness. And she saw the way that the people were interacting. And she heard the songs of, of worship and praise. And, and her father had forbid her to go. As a matter of fact, this village was very hostile to, to Christians. And, and he had forbid her to go. 
He he told her, you know, you stay away from those kind of people. She was told over and over, don't you go there. But she kept sneaking over, and she she would never go in. And and the missionaries who were inside, they they actually saw her outside often. And and they spent a lot of time praying for her. And, And they would get together, and they would pray that this little girl would just walk in the door. They didn't want to scare her off. But they saw her standing at the window. She would stand there for hours listening to the service. And she wouldn't go inside. But then one day, she took a step and she walked in and she was standing at the back. And and the missionary walked over and started talking to her. And she started telling this little girl all about Jesus Christ. And she started telling this little girl about the love that Jesus had, that he came from heaven to earth, and, and he died for her, and, and how much he loved her regardless of, of her past or regardless of her situation or regardless of her circumstances. And, and, and this missionary lady spent a couple of hours talking with her, and then, and then this little girl accepted Jesus Christ as, as her Lord and Savior, and, and they were going to have a baptism a couple of days later later and and so this missionary had a little white dress and uh she gave this little girl a white dress and she was explaining to her that you know when when you go into baptism that 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 baptism is symbolic of you know the way that you were and 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 when you're raised from the dead all all of all of your sins when you come out of the water is symbolic of all of your sins are forgiven and you're white as snow when you accept christ all of your sins are forgiven you're you're new you're clean you're clean And so this little girl, she came in and she got baptized in her little white dress and everything seemed great. They they were rejoicing about it. And then a couple of weeks went by and they didn't see the little girl and they were beginning to, to get worried. And so one Sunday, this missionary went out and in search of this little girl, this little 10 year old girl. And he had gone to the, or she had gone to the village of where this little girl lived and and as she was walking up kind of on the outskirts of of this village she noticed something white that was laying off to the side of the road and so she walked up and uh and she saw this little 10 year old girl beaten and bloodied dressed the little white dress just ripped to shreds and and so the missionary reached down and and she picked up this little girl, and, uh, and she took her back to the church where, where they had a, a, a missionary doctor. And they got back, and, and the doctor, you know, they, they cleaned her up. They, they cut the dress off of her, and they, they put uh, new clothes on her. And, and they did the best they could, but the doctor looked at the missionary and said, I'm, I'm sorry, there's just not much left. I mean, she's got internal injuries that are going to take her, her life. And so they began praying, and... And, and a, an actual miracle happened. The little girl woke up long enough to talk for a couple of minutes. And, and what had happened was her father had found out that she had accepted Christ. And her father had, in a rage, had beaten her basically to death and had ripped that white dress. And they had actually thrown her out of the village into where they throw garbage in the ditches. And so as the missionary is talking to this little girl and she, she starts asking in a very weak, weak voice and she said, uh, she said, can I have my white dress? And the missionary is like, baby, you, you, you don't want, you don't want that white dress. You see, that white dress is, is ripped and it's got your blood on it. And he said, it's in tatters. He said, you don't want that white dress. And she kept asking persistently, could you please, please just get me the white dress? The missionary asked her, he's like, baby, I'm telling you, it's dirty and it's bloody. And she said, please. So he goes over and he hands her the white dress. And he said, why do you want the white dress so much? And she said, in a little bit. When I meet Jesus, I want him to know that I bled for him the way that he bled for me. When I read that story in Voice of the Martyrs, I asked myself, 
would I bleed for the one who bled for me? As the holidays approach, as Thanksgiving comes, here's my challenge to you. Don't worry about the systems. Don't worry about the crazy aunts or the crazy uncles. And if you're one, they're worried about you. Tell them don't worry. But here's the truth of it. Food will be food. Family will be family. As we roll into Christmas, we have an opportunity as a church to reach those far from Christ, to reach those far from God. And we've got a melting pot of traditions and religions, and and, and I, I honor and I respect all of those. And they're comfortable, and I understand that. But there's somebody out there at your workplace. There's somebody out there in your school. There's somebody out there in your home who doesn't know Jesus. Will you tell them about the one who bled for us? You see, we don't have to worry about bleeding as so many around the world do. But here's my question. What are you willing to do to grow the kingdom? What are you willing to do for the Father that he did for us? The last point I have is to safeguard your joy. You've got to focus on the right place. Systems are needed or you have chaos. The right place is the kingdom. The right place is heaven. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Father, the death of His Son, kingdom is for eternity. It's eternal. We have the answer for joy. We have the answer to safeguard our joy. Rejoice in the Lord with everything you've got, with every circumstance you have. For the next six weeks, I'm going to ask this question. Do you know Jesus Christ? Not do you know about Jesus, but do you know Jesus? Do you know the one who came from heaven to earth and died a criminal's death for you? Do you know the one who bled for you? And if the answer is no, I want to encourage you, make that right today. As our elders come up, we're going to enter into a time of communion. This whole thing is about Jesus. It's about the body that was broken. It's about the blood that was shed. And here's the truth of it. We don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. He died a criminal's death for you and I. If you don't know him this morning, I want to invite you. The one thing that will change your life forever is accepting Jesus Christ. And I say that from experience because without him, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. I have amazing parents. I have an amazing wife. I have a great job. But none of it would be possible without Jesus Christ. I can't fathom going through what Paul went through without the joy of Christ. So I want to encourage you this morning, accept him. You don't need to go through me. It's between you and him. I also want to challenge you this morning, before we enter into this time, it's a very sacred time of remembrance of what he did for us. Is there bitterness in your heart? Do you have unforgiveness in your heart? Make it right today. Ask God to to forgive you and to forgive them. Is there something in your life you feel you need forgiven for? Ask for that forgiveness. Have you been away from God for a long time? Come home. Come home. He's standing with his arms open. He never moved from you. He's waiting on you to come home. As we pray, I want you to search within your heart and ask those questions and answer them. And if the answer of any of those is no, make it right. 